Hey everybody, and welcome to another weekly DD with me, Gherkinit. Uh, this week we're going to be looking at our forward technical analysis for the week of 517 through 521. Uh, we're going to be going over a couple sections on institutional ownership, uh, best execution strategies during high volatility, and then we'll just do a quick video wrap up. Uh, I'm going to try to kind of move through this quickly as some of these videos kind of take a little while and hopefully I won't eat up too much of your time. So first things first, technical analysis, the big wedge pennant bull fly, uh, bull pennant, um, mother of all wedges, whatever you want to call it, it's done. It's over. It's kaput. Um, <clears throat> we broke out of it this week at around one thirty on Wednesday. Um, right on schedule. Uh, we did it. There we are. Um, they tried to take out that 157 floor. And as I predicted, we climbed back up above it. They did, however, keep us down for a little while, but ultimately in the end broke out to the upside. And unfortunately, like all good things, the pennant must come to an end. Uh, but just when you thought I was out of technical bullish indicators, prepare yourself. Here's the bull flag. Uh, the bull flag is a technical indicator that forms when a stock has had a rapid move on decent volume to the upside, forming the pull, um, and then reaches a period of downward consolidation known as the flag. Now, while this isn't as reliable as our previous pennant, it still has a 67.13% chance of breaking to the upside. Here it is on the four hour time scale, as indicated by the orange F. Um, so looks good. We've got a new formation and that's what I'll be looking for this week as we test the lower and upper bounds of this consolidation in the next couple days. For those of you that don't remember, don't want to look back, uh, the week before last, uh, we were discussing a MACD crossover and how that could have a potential influence on the price of the stock. So the MACD was about to signal a crossover, uh, as signaled here. Um, but due to the reevaluation of the floor of the stock at 157 by the market, um, for those of you who don't, don't know, GameStop sold 3.5 million shares in the open market at a cost basis of $157. Uh, that change in the reevaluation of the stock price threw a false signal from the MACD and gave us this small green period that you see here where it says reevaluation. Um, as the stock was reevaluated to its now current market price. Um, after that, we dipped back below for a period of consolidation. And now the MACD is showing yet another point of crossover coming up. Um, I don't think this time it's going to be false. Um, I think we're going to see a large move to the upside with volume and volatility this week. As I said, I expected the trend to reverse itself and it looks like that's what's going to happen. So here's your MACD on the one day time scale, as you can see our new signal there. And lastly, I'm going to cover BBKC uh, squeezes and TTM squeeze. Uh, both of these indicators are relatively similar. Um, one only predicts volume and volatility. Um, the other predicts uh, to which side it's going to go. Um, so if we look at our Bollinger Band KC, also BBKC squeeze, we can see that the Bollinger Bands are trending through this period of consolidation inside the Keltner channel. Um, generally what happens is then the Bollinger Bands will expand rapidly over uh, an upcoming period of volume and volatility. And TTM is signaling that that is going to fire to the upside uh, very strongly. We now have 12 consecutive fire signals on the TTM squeeze indicator. Um, and just to go over some other BBKC squeezes from this year, we had uh, this one over here in January. And we had this one uh, at the beginning of March. And over here on this, this yellow indicates the, the time that it is consolidating before the breakout. Uh, usually the greater that period of time, the more volume and volatility. 
And uh, you can see us hanging out right over here at the end of this. Um, yeah, so that's pretty bullish. <laughs> um, and so that's what we're looking at this week. Um, I'll be covering more technical analysis on the stream and in my daily live charting as we move forward. Next up, I want to cover uh, part two, institutional ownership. I've been getting a lot of messages about this this week, and I kind of wanted to try to find out what information I can, as all the 13 Fs aren't filed yet. Um, so our data is, like most of the data that's available is still behind. Uh, I believe we have up until market close tomorrow for them to be filed. But as of right now, the closest thing I could find to up-to-date information was from here at gurufocus.com. And we're looking at 79.61% uh, institutional ownership, um, down 11%, not quite, from uh, March, the end of March, uh, where we were at 90.30 institutional ownership. Remember, this also doesn't count insider ownership. And this doesn't count the float available to the public. This is simply institutional ownership. And this data can't be verified as, like I said, all the institutional filings are not in yet. So this is just partial. And here's why I think it doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> coming up, uh, we're currently on the uh, reconstitution calendar for the Russell indices. Um, as you can see by the schedule here, uh, May and June is the rebalancing period. Um, GME is now sitting at a market cap of $11.32 billion, which is significantly up from where it was during reconstitution in 2020. And so several ETFs and indexes will need to move into institutional ownership roles as they will otherwise be underweight. Um, if you want to know what that means, you can check out our Reddit link down below. Um, it should be pinned to my profile um, and you can read more on it there and that link will uh, take you to a page where there's some more information on that. Uh, as, as that goes with anything in this due diligence, if you want more information, I suggest you check out the post on Reddit and read it for yourself as I provide a lot of links there to other information that you can access. So that looks good. I think we're going to see a lot of volatility over the coming month as these ETFs and uh, large indices come in. Uh, there's also a possibility that GameStop gets picked up on the Russell 1000, so even more ETFs and indices will be buying into it. And I think that's going to give us a lot of volatility in this coming month as they attempt to rebalance their portfolios. All right, so the last thing I wanted to go over in this video DD was execution during periods of high volatility. Um, this is going to be a little difficult to cover as we've had a lot of things going on at the primary GameStop subreddit. Uh, things I don't really want to get into. Um, I don't think it's worthwhile. But it did bring to light the fact that this needed to be addressed. And I want to address it in a way where I'm not going to tell you how best to execute your orders. That's not my place. But what I do want to do is inform you on exec order execution during high volatility and on how orders are executed and what order types execute in what ways. And so the first thing that we're going to kind of touch on here is the issues that can arise during periods of high volatility. Uh, the first one, delays. Uh, volatile markets are associated with high volume, um, and this can cause delays in execution. And as online traders, we expect to see the price on our screen as being the price we sell at. And during these periods, that's not always the case. Um, the second is system issues. Everyone should be pretty familiar with this. Who was hodling back in January or in March um, as we experienced the greatest points of volatility regarding this stock. Um, when the traffic ramps up, we can have difficulty accessing our accounts, accessing YouTube, subreddits. Um, I'm not sure about Discord, but that may have had issues at some point. Um, just remember that these issues can arise, stay calm. I don't think the MOAS is going to take forever. Um, but make sure that you're prepared for this. Um, for me, I'm, I'm making sure I have backup internet connections, um, and that I have, you know, other ways of accessing my accounts during this period. Also 
Um, I urge you to get in touch with your brokers and find out what solutions they have for situations like this. Some of them will have phone sales available. Some of them will have live brokers that you can speak to on the trading floor that uh, are, are there to help you facilitate your orders during these periods of high volatility. The next is incorrect quotes. So this kind of ties into the delays. Um, the real-time quoting systems that we use in the trading software, uh, whatever your trading software of choice is, you, you will experience these issues. Um, they even experience them in, you know, Bloomberg terminals that are fiber wired into the market. And so we're definitely going to fall prey to this. Um, the size of the quote can change rapidly. Um, and that can affect the likelihood of quote availability. Um, so as the system gets busier and busier, we can expect more delays in the price quotes. And the, the, the number you see on the screen may not be accurate. And then lastly, I just wanted to touch on algorithms. They make all of this worse. Um, they're const they'll constantly try to front run each other during these times, creating more and more volatility in whatever direction the price is moving. Stay calm. Um, just remember that this is, you know, going to be exacerbated, uh, probably significantly from what you've even seen in the past on, on this stock. Um, and I offer some more reading, reading. I found a really interesting article on how algorithms can affect volatility. And I suggest you read that. Um, there is a chance that market makers will at some point switch to manual trading um, at or near the peak of this as the algorithms can lose them money. Um, unfortunately, computers can only do what they're programmed to do and they can't kind of think on their feet in that, in that regard. Um, so how do we navigate this? And I don't think there's a perfect answer, but like most things, I think the answer lies in me giving you the information you taking that information and turning it into knowledge, and hopefully that will give you the confidence to move forward through this situation. Um, here are the order types, and I'm going to then address their pros and cons. Um, so first, you have the limit order. A limit order is an order to sell a security at a specified price or better. Um, meaning that when your limit is hit, whether it be buy or sell, it will attempt to get you that stock at that price, if not at a better price. So whether that be lower in the interest of buying or higher in the interest of selling, um, that is the goal of a limit order. Um, the next up is a market order. A market order is an order to buy or stock, sell a stock at the best available price. And then this isn't determined by you. This is determined by market conditions at the time that the market order is placed. <clears throat> Next up, we have a stop limit order. Uh, stop limit order is a conditional trade that combines the features of the previous limit order with the risk mitigation of a stop loss. And then finally, we have the stop loss order, an order placed in this manner converts to a market order when the set price is reached. So it comes with the same best available price that a market order does, but it does not trigger until its stop loss price is hit. So essentially if the price is coming down and it hits the stop loss order, then a market order will immediately be made for the underlying at the best available price. So I want to go over some of the pros and cons on these real quick. Um, you can look them up again. If you check the Reddit post, I have several links there that I highly encourage everyone to read. If you have the time, if not, hopefully this brief synopsis will give you an idea of when each is best. No type of order is bad. They just serve different situations differently. A limit order guarantees that if the order is filled, it is filled at or above the set price. This is beneficial in that when your limit is triggered, it will attempt to fill your order at the price that your order is set at. And if it can't, it will attempt to fill it above that price. This controls your execution price. The downside of this is that because of the controlled execution price, you can miss the opportunity. If the stock drops below where your limit is set, 
then your order will not fill. Um, it's not guaranteed to fill. Next up, we have the market order, and this is the most straightforward type of trade. Um, it's pretty much what most trades, most people who buy stock or sell stock are using market orders. They're simple, straightforward, to the point, but there are issues with them. Um, they guarantee immediate execution. So as soon as you hit the sell button, your order is being executed. Um, and this guarantees the best available price. In the markets, that price isn't up to you. It's determined by the range of where the stock is trading at the price the order hits the market. Um, the downside to market orders is that they're most at risk for variation and lag in available data. So where you place the order at whatever price you see on your screen when you place that order, your order may not fill at that price or even near that price. It'll simply fill at whatever the market is trading at when it gets that order. Um, it's the equivalent of selling without negotiating. Um, you're essentially saying, I need to sell this thing right now. Um, there's no talk of price. Um, and this carries risk during high volatility because you don't know what your order will fill at and it can fill significantly below the target you assume you're selling at. And now I want to go over the stop limit order. It allows traders to precisely control their fill. It combines the features of a stop loss with a limit order in order to mitigate risk. Upon execution of the stop, it becomes a limit order. So <clears throat> as soon as your stop is triggered on a stop limit order, it becomes a limit order. Again, it comes with the same caveats of a limit order in that it is not guaranteed to fill. Um, however, these tend to be more complicated and they're not available with all online trading platforms. So even though they can offer you the most accuracy, if you get caught up in the minutia of them, you can end up being in a worse position than if you were just simply setting a limit order before the current trading price <clears throat> or under the current trading price. Um, stop limit orders sort of work this way. Um, cause I do want to go a little deeper into how these are, are used. Um, essentially if you have a stock trading at $10 and you have a stop limit order at nine with the limit being eight, what will happen is that when the stock drops to nine, the stop limit order will trigger effectively putting a limit order onto the market at $8. Now that order can fill at any price between eight and $9 as it is a limit order. So essentially this kind of like warns your limit order to trigger in time for the descending price. And then finally you have the stop loss order, a stop loss order limits loss on a security that makes an unexpected move. I use these frequently in day trading as I have a predefined risk. Um, essentially, I don't want to lose more than 10% risk in any given trade. So whatever trade I go into will immediately have a stop loss set for 10%. Um, GME does not necessarily work this way uh, obviously to each investor their own but i do not like the idea of setting stop loss orders on gme and we'll get into why here in a second um <clears throat> they protect against emotion and uncertainty so if you have a, a trailing stop of this 10 percent risk it ensures that no matter where the stock goes you'll never lose more than 10 percent of the price it's currently trading at um, they do not have to be actively monitored. Uh, you can set a stop loss and walk away from them for however long you set the stop loss for. And if they trigger, they trigger and it'll sell without any input from you. Um, however, they do turn into a market order upon being triggered. So they're at risk for the same thing as a market order in the sense that, you know, they do fall risk to variation and lag in available data. 
um, and they carry more greater risk during high volatility because of that. And again, you're selling without negotiating. Um, the other dangerous thing, if you're holding a position long with a stop loss order, is that they can be inadvertently triggered. So even if you have a stop trailing stop as low as like say 20% off the current trading price, the stock can quickly dip over the course of one candle. Um, some shares may be traded at that price. The market sees that as the price. Uh, it triggers your stop loss, then your shares are traded at that price. Um, now the market can immediately turn around back to the upside and you would have lost whatever positions you had in that stop loss order. And so it carries a significant risk when you're carrying long term because you don't want to sell the underlying at a lower cost. Um, and they also do not guarantee a fill at their trigger price. So if the stock is dropping rapidly and you have a stop loss order in place, um, when the stop loss is triggered, it will simply submit a market order. And when that market order is submitted, whatever the price the stock is trading at as that market order is filled is going to be the price the shares sell for. And so essentially you have, like, if your stop is at, let's use that $10 example from before, if your stop is at $10 and the price is rapidly declining, and your market goes order goes in at ten dollars. It may fill at five or six. It may not fill at ten. <clears throat> and so that's the inherent risk of carrying a stop loss order, especially on a large position. All right. And so that's it. Um, I hope that gives you guys some insight into how those various orders work and the risks and rewards for each one. And hopefully that will give you the ability to utilize them going forward. Um, each one does have their place, um, but I think it is best that you learn how to use each one beneficially. So everything looks good this week. Um, Last Thursday, we had that run. A lot of open interest on the options market got rolled into this coming week. IV remains low, so I can expect long side whales to still want to continue to come in on call options, possibly setting up a gamma ramp for this Friday, uh, this coming Friday. Uh, I expect we're going to continue in this positive trend cycle. We're going to continue to see bullish indicators and have bullish momentum. It's all playing out pretty slow but it's playing out nonetheless. Um, on, on the subreddit, lastly, I do kind of touch on some things that I see in the community. I think I've written it better than I can address it in a video. And if that's something that you're interested in, please check out my post over on our super stonk. And, and I'm pretty sure it'll also be cross posted to our subreddit, our dillionaires. As always, um, if you guys can, drop a like or a subscribe. It helps the channel out. And if you want to support the channel, there's a Ko-Fi link down below where you can facilitate that. As always, any support is appreciated. I thank you all so much, and I will see you bright and early tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.